Good morning. Today on Spotlight, a conversation with Detroit City Council President Mary Sheffield. As leader of the legislative body for Michigan's largest city, she has a lot on her plate. From economic development, to housing, to diverse neighborhood programs, to public safety. We'll get an update on some of these priority issues. It's Sunday, July the 10th. I'm Chuck Stokes, and this is Spotlight. Madam President, good having you back with us on Spotlight. You're doing okay? Hopefully you had a good July 4th. I did. Thank you. Always good to be here. Oh, it's always good talking to you. Uh, you have a boatload of stuff on your plate, as well <laughs> as your fellow members of the Detroit City Council and the legislative body for the largest city in this state. Um, let's start with something that we touched on last time you were on, but there have been some developments, and that's this Detroit Right to Council, uh, which has gotten a lot of publicity. It's something that you and your colleagues passed unanimously. Uh, a few weeks ago, I interviewed Tanya Myers Phillips, an attorney who you know well, and she, she was elated, gave kudos to you and all your colleagues. Uh, she said, we've got the foundation, now we just have to build the house. Is that how you see it? I do, I do, and I'm grateful. We have made tremendous strides as it relates to providing uh, an attorney to tenants who are facing eviction. Um, out of 30,000 evictions roughly annually in Detroit, only 4% of individuals actually had access to an attorney. Uh, studies have been, you know, shown over and over again that if you have access to an attorney, that evictions actually drop within the city. And so we are just uh, elated to have passed this piece of legislation. We had it funded partially with ARPA funding, which is American Rescue Act Plan dollars, which is federal funds, and then some of the money that uh, Dan Gilbert and his foundation put up. So we are just looking forward to serving low-income residents throughout the city who need uh, an attorney to be able to have access to one throughout their eviction proceedings. And I think really it's about stabilizing our neighborhoods as we oftentimes see that it's really just about, um, you know, landlords sometimes having power, not necessarily having a case that has merit, but because they have attorneys and they're represented, oftentimes tenants lose out um, and are evicted from their homes. Uh, studies have shown that you get about a three to one ratio yep. on return of investment and in you do this, that a lot of times it's a lot of money up front just because yep. you're trying to put your finger in the dike uh, and get a hold of the problem, but that once you get things up and rolling, that it's a good return on investment for the community. You agree? I agree. And I'm, I'm glad that you mentioned that because it really started off kind of as a moral issue. Um, but then when we started looking at the Stout Report and a lot of the research that had been done in other cities, uh, we realized that it is an, an economic um, uh, argument for the need to have a right to counsel legislation in Detroit. And so when we started seeing that the finances also made sense, too, I think it really helped our argument to get this piece of legislation done. So we're really excited to have it. You know, women of color, women with children are disproportionately impacted by evictions. And so we're saving and protecting um, our women in Detroit as well, too, and our families. So I'm just really excited to have this in place. And it will be implemented uh, no later than October of this year. We're in the process of you know, putting everything together, hiring a coordinator who actually run the program. But no later than October, it will be in place. And you have to be below the federal poverty line to get access to this particular program. Sure. Where will the money come from? Because I understand you're going to need about $17 million on that first year. You've got money from the Gilbert Foundation, but that's sort of designated a different way. That's over three years, and that's really for uh, three organizations that are hiring some of the attorneys. But long term, uh, the weight's really on city council to come up with that funding. Yeah, long term, we have to still um, advocate that additional ARPA dollars be used to fully fund this program. We're not quite up to $17 million per year, but we're getting there. Um, and so the idea was to at least uh, let the first year roll out, see the need and see where the gaps are. And then next year we'll advocate for additional funding to be able to um, fully fund this particular program. Uh, last question on this. Uh, you got the unanimous vote from city council. I would assume that that means everybody's totally on board, uh, not just with the initial vote, but with all the steps that you've just articulated have to be done or is there any dissension on council in terms of putting the, the nuts and bolts of this together? 
Yeah, I think everyone's on board with the need um, and supports the idea that people should have access to an attorney. I think the area of contention is how do we actually fund this? Uh, there is some opinions that we cannot use general fund dollars or that we should not use general fund dollars. And so the issue I think that is kind of outstanding is how do we fund this long term? What's the, the sustainability of the actual program? And so I think that's where the uh, kind of the dialogue will take place moving forward is how do we actually fund this? But everyone um, that I've had conversation with understands the need of this actual program. As leader of the council, you're fully confident, though, that by October 1, everything's going to be in place? Yeah, October 1, the ordinance is passed. The money is there. Uh, individuals and families throughout Detroit will have access to an attorney for their eviction proceedings if they meet the criteria. It's just, again, how do we sustain this program long term and how do we get it fully funded so that we can help more people throughout Detroit? Sure. Let's shift our gears um, in terms of economic development, probably the thing that's getting the lion's share of attention right now is smack dab in downtown with that high rise building going up on the Hudson site. Uh, yeah. Dan Gilbert and his company have asked for a tax abatement of about to the tune of about $60 million. He's asked city council to delay that vote a couple of times. We're, bring us up to date where we at. So yeah, I think we're at a point where we have heard from both business and community, and I think there is various opinions. I honestly think that there's a lot of support for it and a lot of support uh, against it. Um, and I think at this moment, uh, the idea was to remove this from the council table to allow more discussions. I think there's a lot more education that needs to happen around what take tax abatements are, uh, the DDA district, what it means, how it actually impacts Detroit, uh, and then also talk a little bit more about how Detroiters are going to benefit from this building. One of the things that I've learned and, and I've heard in almost every conversation that I've had with, with residents is we're not necessarily against the development, but we want to make sure that Detroiters benefit from it. And so my conversations with uh, Dan Gilbert's team at this point is just making sure that um, Detroiters benefit from, from this development. How can we strengthen the community benefits process? Uh, a lot of this building will be about retail and commercial space. And so I'm fighting to ensure that a portion of that is set aside for Detroit businesses. I'm also fighting that they increase their overall commitment of affordable housing throughout their entire portfolio. Uh, and then I also want to see a commitment of at least $5 million going into a neighborhood improvement fund, uh, which is a fund that can only be used outside of Midtown and Downtown. And sure. so just really trying to get tangible benefits to the community if, in fact, we move forward with this abatement for this particular development. How much are you and your colleagues having to take into consideration that economic landscape has changed from when all of this was originally proposed and voted on by council? We've had, we've had or still having a pandemic. Uh, that certainly has affected the economy and uh, materials. Costs yeah. have gone up all these things that I could articulate. I imagine all that's part of this discussion. Most definitely. I mean, we are post pandemic um, costs, as you mentioned, have have, have risen um, labor shortages, et cetera. And we have seen it. I think that they have provided um, their financial need for this particular abatement. Um, and it's really incumbent upon us again, just to make sure that uh, in light of that, again, that Detroiters are benefited from it. So I do understand the financial need for it. I understand that construction cost has, has definitely risen. But again, I think understanding where we are in Detroit and some of the needs and priorities of, of Detroiters, people want to make sure that, that, that you know, again, Detroiters are, are benefiting from it and that we're addressing other issues, issues of lack of affordable housing in Detroit, issues of infrastructure. You know, people's houses are still flooding when it rains. And so when they see that we're giving an abatement to um, a development, but there's all of these inner city issues, people wonder about priorities. And so that's why I'm always trying to bridge the two together and figure out how we can have a win in downtown Detroit, but also bring some benefits and tangible relief to those in the community as well. Sure, one final question on this. Uh, Dan Gilbert certainly has been a huge Detroit booster and his company has certainly done a lot of uh, positive things for the city of Detroit. In your discussions with them, are, is, it a, is it a healthy discussion as you put these other items on the table to be able to say, yes, we want to work with you, but we've got to also make sure that at the end of the day, the citizens that we represent 
uh, don't see this as just something that benefits business. It also trickles down to, as you said, affordable housing and other things. Yes, I have to say they have been more than willing to welcome uh, to to uh, work with me and to negotiate some of the requests uh, that I have made. And I have to be honest, over the last year or so, uh, I've seen major commitments from the Gilbert Foundation. They just invested thirty million dollars into home repair. They just stood with me for issues like right to counsel and helping to fund right to counsel. They've been a uh, tremendous leader in the issue of foreclosures throughout the city of Detroit. So they have given back. Uh, in a lot of very important issues that are important to Detroiters. So I appreciate their willingness to negotiate and to talk uh, through these issues. And we're hoping that we can come to some type of resolve that you know benefits all of Detroit. Sure, before we go to break, uh, any prediction on when this may come back before the council for a vote? Too early to Yes, say. I, it will come back before we go to recess, uh, which will probably be before the end of July. Okay, we need to take a quick yeah. little break. We'll come back and we'll talk about some stuff going on in the neighborhoods. We'll be right back, stay with us. And we're back on Spotlight with Detroit City Council President Mary Sheffield. Uh, you have been, one of the things you said at the beginning of your leadership uh, direction there when you took over as Council President, you said, I want full transparency uh, among this government body as it relates to the people. Uh, you've had a ton of meetings. Uh, some of them have been virtual, trying to find out what it is Detroiters want. Uh, what's the main thing you've gotten back from those different district meeting hearings? You know, I just think that the importance of the uh, continued transparency and in including the voice of residents in decision making. Um, you know, Detroiters have a lot of thoughts, a lot of ideas, and they know their communities more than anybody because they live there. And so really valuing the, the, the opinions uh, of Detroiters as we move forward with legislation and decisions, I think is very important. Um, and so, again, example with the Hudson site, you know, making sure that we're including their voice in that process throughout the entire budget. We held meetings in every district to get their priorities as we begin to allocate money towards uh, different projects, I just think is important. So uh, valuing and respecting the, the concerns and needs of, of Detroit is important. Sure. We're coming up on uh, Luther Keast uh, Detroit. Neighborhoods <laughs> Day with the Rise Detroit uh, always gets a lot of attention and certainly something that has uh, uh, put a big footprint on the city of Detroit in terms of cleanup. Uh, but there's also all kind of beautification programs. That's one thing that you and your colleagues have pushed to make sure that people are aware that there's so many programs out there that they can avail themselves of to. Yeah, and we just recently, um, I'm so excited to announce the Neighborhood Beautification Program, which was actually funded under uh, the NIF, which is the Neighborhood Improvement Fund that I created uh, a couple of years ago. And this will allow neighborhood black clubs and, and, and organizations and churches and nonprofits to have access to grants anywhere from $500 to $15,000. And it's a way really just to give back to residents. You know, a lot of times it's these organizations that are maintaining our communities. They're cutting the grass. They're keeping our blocks and neighborhoods clean. And a lot of times they have visions for their communities, but don't have access to funding uh, to be able to bring those visions to life. And so this beautification grant um, is a way to provide funding to be able to bring those uh, visions to life and to keep our communities clean and to activate areas that may be, um, you know, blighted within our, our communities. Sure. Uh, Madam Sheffield, are you pleased with the number of recreation programs that we have out here for our young people? We're in the midst of summertime. Uh, it's a time when we try to make sure the kids have a lot to do, keep them busy, keep them out of trouble. Um, and then I know that's something that the mayor has pushed, cleaning mm -hmm. up the parks. Um, are you guys in sync on what you currently have and what you may want down the line? Yeah, I mean, we have a lot of programs for our young people. I think there's always, you know, room for improvement. I uh, would love to see, you know, all of our rec centers um, up and running. Um, as we have done as much as we can to get those back open for our young people and to activate programming for our young people. Uh, I'm really excited that Grow Detroit Young Talent will be launching um, this coming Monday, actually. We'll be making an announcement for that to be actually starting where we put thousands of young people to work uh, in various sectors of, of organizations and, and backgrounds. And so 
uh, I'm excited about that. That is a program that has been going on for quite some time where we're actually putting young people to work. They're gaining skills uh, and actually, um, you know, learning a lot. And so we have a lot of ways to go, but I'm, I'm proud of the work that we've done this far to make sure our young people have productive things to do uh, over the summer. What's the go of your Occupy the Corner program? Uh, it's an annual program. You've had it. It's been successful. You even got Mike Epps, the comedian, uh, <laughs> actor, and um, uh, you know we could go on with all his different titles uh, to come in this year. That got a lot of attention. Yeah, I mean the the mission is to engage, connect, and empower inner city communities to improve their quality of life, and it actually started in response to gun violence. And my main thing is, you know, hey, we cannot police our way out of gun violence. We have to address the underlining social issues that breed gun violence in our communities. And I believe that that's lack of, you know, education, access to job training and resources, et cetera, mental health. And so the idea is to engage and connect and empower these inner city kind of disenfranchised communities with resources that will improve their quality of life. And so we go and occupy areas where we believe there may be a disconnect to resources and we bring all of these things right to their front porch. We uh, essentially bring city government to you and we empower these individuals uh, with these resources that we believe will improve the quality of life. So it's also really you know, addressing the underlying social issues, the disconnect that may be there, but also having a good time and empowering the community as well. Sure, uh, as we speak of gun violence, we'd be remiss if we didn't talk about uh, the recent tragedy here in Detroit, a uh, Detroit police officer uh, yeah. killed as a result of gun violence. It seems to be the latest in what is a wave of gun violence throughout this country, uh, city, suburban, you name it, yeah. small towns, big towns. What do we do about this? You know, I, I really believe that it is a all hands on deck approach and no longer can we normalize it. Um, we really have to understand that it's not just police, it's not the elected officials, it's not the church, it's, it's everyone. You know, it's neighborhood block clubs, it's everyone mentoring and reaching out and, and figuring out how we can play a role in solving this issue. It is a public health crisis, it is a public health issue, and it should be treated as such. And so uh, we're doing our work on city council. We actually just launched a gun violence task force, myself and member Durhal. Uh, and we're going to continue to 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 address this issue of violence. But I, I truly believe that it is a we it's a we issue. It's not just uh, law enforcement and elected officials. We all have to play our role in, in making sure we reduce some violence throughout our community. Yeah, well, I assume we need much more money going into mental health. Uh, you know, certainly you have a faction out there that says guns aren't the problem. People are the problem and that we aren't putting enough resources into mental health. Do you agree with that? I completely agree. Mental health, job training, education, uh, eliminating poverty as much as we can. I think people just need access to opportunity. Uh, we need mentorships. We need just to create an environment where people can thrive and have access to that. And again, uh, government plays a role in that. It's about prioritizing our funding and how we prioritize different initiatives. I think that's important. But again, this is a community issue as well, too. And so I urge everyone uh, to really raise your voice and be involved in, in, in not normalizing what we're seeing throughout our city and our country. All right, we're going to take a real quick break. We'll come right back with just one final question and get okay. you back on your tight schedule. Okay. We'll be right back. Stay with us. Madam President, as we begin to wrap up here, uh, any final thoughts? Because you have worked over a number of years back and forth in terms of this whole issue of water shutoffs. Where are we now? Are we making a lot of progress on this? We have made a lot of progress. Uh, there was recently an announcement of an income-based uh, water, afford water affordability plan, which I'm excited to hear. Uh, however, my work with advocates uh, goes well beyond probably about maybe six years we've been working on this issue. We would like still to see an ordinance in place, uh, something that codifies this process. We know that some individuals just cannot afford. This is about individuals who can't afford, not people who are trying to take advantage of uh, the system. But we would like to see an income-based water, water affordability ordinance in place that ensures people who cannot pay um, are not burdened with the, the amount of, of, of the cost of water affordability. All right. Uh, quick final question. We're in a big election year. 
Um, in your position, are you weighing in on any particular race <laughs> that you that you want to see somebody win or lose on, or are you trying to, uh, as council president, uh, stay out of the fray and let them fight it out in the primary and let's yeah. see what happens coming in the general? That's exactly what I'm doing, and I, I wish everyone the best. There's a lot of great people, especially in the congressional races, um, that I really have not um, gotten involved in too much because we have a lot of great candidates, and so. I have not taken a position, but plan to do so after the primary. All right. Madam President, thanks so much for joining us today on Spotlight. We will stay in touch with you and uh, keep us up to date on when that Hudson site comes back for a vote before the council. I will do. I appreciate you as always. All right. It's our pleasure. And we'll be right back with some closing thoughts right after this. And finally, our condolences to the family and friends of DPD officer Lauren Quartz, who tragically lost his life in the line of duty. Along with so many others, our thoughts are with the entire Detroit Police Department and all those who serve to protect. The violence in this country is, is outrageous. Uh, the assaults against police officers is outrageous. And tonight we lost our hero in our department. Uh, and, you know, Regardless of where you stand on the, what side of political aisle you're on on this issue of gun violence, it's entirely too much gun violence in the city, too much gun violence in this country. And now we've got an officer who has paid the ultimate sacrifice, putting his life on the line for you and me, you and me, every single day. Uh, and officers are doing it right now, even after this call. Enough is enough. I just spent time with uh, the family uh, who, who described our fallen officer is somebody who had a calling uh, for the community and was doing uh, what he loved. And, you know, we owe uh, a debt of gratitude to all the officers out there working. And uh, tonight we have an officer and a family with a debt uh, that we can never repay. Where is our help? Where is our help? This is happening not just to civilians, but police officers, as you can see. So we need everybody to cooperate right now. This is a cry out for help. A special thanks to Council President Mary Sheffield for sitting down with us this week to talk about some very important issues. I'm Chuck Stokes. We'll be back next week with more newsmakers in the spotlight. We hope you have a great week.